intros here this morning. I'm going to start with different music than I usually do because of the theme of our first intro. So, this one begins with Alonzo. There was a group that did a song called Land of a Thousand Dances, and the moves inspired by the song led to at least a thousand buffalo stances. In 1965, this group peaked at number 30 with this song, and while they weren't about politics, today I think that's wrong. Cannibal and the Headhunters was the group with this hit that was hearty, but lately, when I think of cannibals now, Alonzo Perry, I think of your Republican Party. <laughs> That's a long I don't know way how I feel about that. Eating, it, <laughs> eating itself from within, Alonzo, in Berkeley you, County. You still feel warm and cuddly on the inside? <laughs> I, I, I feel great. I feel awesome. Warm and cuddly on the inside, but with those nice tasty cakes on the outside. Thanks to Senator Capito, by the way, who we appreciate bringing food. All right, now. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. Moving on to number two. His brothers are in a lawsuit with ChatGPT, something to do with theft of intellectual property. Names like Hillenbrand, Martin, Grisham, and Picot. Just some of the names of these authors you know. But only one of them has the scoop, indeed all the dirt. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap, who has his own Facebook page, as does his shirt. <laughs> Not the one you have on today, though. No, no. I was hoping for the loud shirt, so it, you know, it would play with it, but it, you didn't give it to me today. Lately, it seems that being one of his ilk is a lot like showing up on a carton of milk. Democrats of any stripe are hard to find in this state, but all things are temporary. At least, that's my take. Republicans turning on themselves could mean a turnaround for Dems is starting. That being the case, it could be that Larry Schultz's party may give up their space on that cotton. <laughs> it would be nice to be found again. It would be nice. <laughs> but will you be is the question. All right. Now, uh, for the next one here, um, I'm going to need some photo assistance from our wonderful producer, Colin McLaughlin, the sports doctor. This would be uh, Mr. Ferretti's intro. <laughs> so funny, Joe. So funny. Are you there? <laughs> Run, Joe. Yeah, here. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I thought I'd bring this classic back on screen. Uh, he thrilled us all oh, just a. <laughs> he, he, he thrilled us all just a few weeks ago with cloudy images of a blurry photo. Comparisons were made and similarities were drawn. They said Torch was busy getting his Hasselhoff on. <laughs> Joe, I'm sure you'd like me to delete that photo that continues to haunt. But as the Stones once sang, you can't always get what you want. <laughs> My wife wants to know where that body went. <laughs> yeah. Well, hard work and dieting, Joe. Hard work and dieting. All right, now, uh, next up, the Admiral. <laughs> if a picture is worth a thousand words, then looking at this shouldn't be trouble. I should easily be able to come up with that many, maybe even double. A brave soldier, a fearless leader, a man to be respected, an institute founder, a volunteer, an official to be elected. But all of those words are just a topping, if you will, a gravy. The best two words to describe this picture are, I think, McHale's Navy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love that yeah. picture. Actually, we were, I was uh, navigating on my way to Antarctica where that picture was taken. Shouldn't you have been dressed more warmly? Well, we were not yet in Antarctica. We were uh, navigating toward towards Antarctica. Antarctica. <laughs> what, what's, just the, a, what's the land mass just uh, behind you or off to your right? A cloud. The one in the no no the one in the water. <laughs> is there a is there no. is that a part of the device you're using? I thought it looked uh, like a little island. No no it's not an island. Okay. And this Larry is why you're not allowed to navigate. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was Navy ROTC. We went through a whole process of determining my fitness. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> All right, issue number one. Our lead off hitter Joe Joey Torts Ferretti. You're on the clock. Even back then, Stubblefield had a problem making that right turn. Um, <laughs> bad idea, Captain. Bad idea. <laughs> All right. I, I, look, I was going to uh, cover this issue about uh, the factions that we're seeing in the Republican Party, both on a national level that might lead to a shutdown, and, and of course, at the local level here in West Virginia because of uh, – the Freedom Caucus now rising up and, and growing in numbers. But I, I, 
that was discussed a little bit in the segment with our, our dear senator. So I, I'm going to switch gears, and I apologize to the group here, but I thought yesterday the announcement by Rupert Murdoch that he is stepping down from News Corp and, and Fox News is, uh, is a really big issue because of the impact that he and Fox has had on this country going back now almost 30 years. 1996, he started Fox News, and it came aboard with much fanfare about being fair and balanced. Uh, some of the programming on Fox, as you remember, was a little bit edgy. Some of the sitcoms and all were, were a little different uh, for this country, but we quickly adopted them, and we adopted Fox News as a purveyor of a fair and balanced news production. However, that quickly changed when Roger Ailes came aboard, uh, he being a, a, quite a political operative, and, and they decided then as a corporate policy that they could monetize the politics of the day and, and really were successful in doing so, growing Fox News into quite an empire, which included uh, Wall Street Journal, 20th Century Fox, the New York Post, on and on and on. Well, I thought the legacy of Rupert Murdoch is important to discuss because uh, with the good – uh, another news outlet for, in this case, for conservatives. Uh, there's also been the bad. Uh, there's been discussions about uh, uh, conspiracy theories regarding Clinton and Obama and, and COVID-19 quackery and the Great Replacement Theory and things like that that have been given airtime on Fox. And, of course, we know how this all culminated in a major lawsuit where – Rupert Murdoch and the corporation had to pay out almost a billion dollars to settle a case with Dominion regarding the false reporting of uh, voting machines being rigged for, for the benefit of President Biden. So the legacy of Murdoch is a complicated one. It's an important one for us to understand. And I think it's important to understand it in a fair and balanced way. That is, he did serve a purpose. The news organization served a purpose, I think an important one for this country, but it went awry. And now it is hollowed out. They had to fire some talent. They uh, are, have lost viewership to other news outlets. And you just wonder about what the legacy will be down the road. But for now, I think we have to look at this both with a, uh, an admiring eye towards what he accomplished, but also a critical eye towards what he has uh, really how he's impacted this country and, and sometimes in a negative way. All right. Rupert Murdoch's legacy. Let's start first with Alonzo Perry. Yeah. So uh, I think that Fox is fair and balanced in the concept of understanding that all of the country's media, right, is so far to the left, whether it be MSNBC, CNN, you know, that there's never really been a voice for flyover country. And so uh, by Fox kind of standing, you know, uh, against some of the coastal elite ideas that have came through some of our corporate media, I think that, you know, Rupert Mur Murdoch has a, a, a tr phenomenal legacy in that sense of, you know, being able to have that conversation with America um, and giving the right some semblance of a voice. And I think it's really tr sad that, you know, a lot of people are starting to abandon um, even Fox News now. And who knows what the implications of that are going to look like um, as we start moving forward in this kind of digital age and uh, as time will tell. But I think Rupert Murdoch actually will have a, a, a pretty astonishing legacy. And I want to throw in there that, you know, uh, some of the ways that news has been revolutionized in the terms of how uh, certain things are covered, uh, the formatting of the actual screens, you know, there was a lot of innovation that, that made news, um, for better or for worse, more entertaining than uh, it probably has been in times past. And whether we think that that was, you know, a phenomenal thing or not, it got a lot of people informed on the issues and talking about politics in general. So... Uh, in, in the grand scheme, I think Rupert Murdoch was a hero, and uh, you know it's nice to see him step down before he you know extends his term a little too far. Larry Schultz, something tells me you'll feel differently. Well, I, I don't think that Rupert Murdoch um, did us any favors uh, by forming Fox News in the first place. Um, uh, you know, there were plenty of conservatives and plenty of Republicans 
elected when there was no Fox News. Um, our country was pretty evenly divided for a lot of years between the two parties. Um, I think that th- what Fox started to do was the blending of opinion and news to the point where now to a, a great deal of its audience, the two things are not separate at all. Facts and opinions, uh, you know, f- uh, facts are supposed to drive opinions. And in Fox world, you don't even know if what they're telling you is a fact or the opinion of Tucker Carlson. Um, and so the descriptions that they use and the way those things get blended, even Mike Carl has said, I like to watch the news part, but when Tucker Carlson comes on, I turn it off. It, because he recognizes that there's a blending there. And it's not the only place it happens. It certainly happens on MSC and NBC and the others. But... Um, Mr. I don't think Mr. Murdoch has done us any favors. We're the average American is less of a critical thinker, I believe, as a result of Mr. Uh, Murdoch's work than they would have been had there been no Rupert Murdoch. Mr. Gilstrap. William Randolph Hearst famously triggered the Spanish-American War. I think that... Journalism, I started my career, I started in undergraduate school, what I wanted to do is become a journalist. And I was driven by Woodward and Bernstein and the Watergate investigations, that sort of thing. And very shortly into my first job at a, at a magazine, the trade magazine, I came to realize that journalism has very, very little to do with truth. Journalism has everything to do with satisfying advertisers. And it has been that way forever. Long before there were, um, there were newspaper, before there were television, there, was, there, was, there were newspapers. And the newspapers are, they understand who their audiences are and they tailor the stories accordingly. I grew up in the DC suburbs. We had the Washington Post in the morning and we had the Washington Star in the afternoon. Two entirely different takes on the same story. You had Time and Newsweek used to be somewhat disparate, but now they've, they've kind of joined forces. There's nothing new here. Rupert Murdoch was a businessman. He built a media empire that's based on a model that has been established a long time ago. And Larry, to your point, you know, it used to be back in the days in the vaunted days of of Walter Cronkite and the the news department was a loss leader. It was designed to provide public service to, you know, and as a because we gave the the airwaves to the the networks, the networks paid it back with by by providing news to the public. Now they've become profit centers and that has changed everything. So a pox on all their houses. I don't think that it's it's possible to get a straight news story anywhere. I choose to read several newspapers. I, I do. I try not to watch television news at all because that is truly infotainment, and it's driven by who's who's good looking and who's you know who's got the shtick and all of that it has very little to do with the facts that are being presented. So what you do is is you try to meander. I try to meander my way through a lot of different opinions, and. And then try to figure it out for myself. But I think to to lay um, uh, opinion driven journalism on Rupert Murdoch or anybody else for that matter, I, I think that's fundamentally unfair because this has been going on s- since you know the days of John Peter Zenger, Mr. Stumbleville. Yes, I and John, you're exactly right. It's been uh, in the print media. Uh, it's uh, political statements have been used. Uh, to to get their point across pen, uh, print media for before the history of our country and long before that, uh, but what surprises me is that in the television uh, front we went for so many years without the uh, the uh, television stations being a political device abc cbs nbc probably the closest thing we came was meet the press and that was uh, uh that did not insert uh, opinions uh but it was only when cnn came in but cnn in its early days uh was uh, uh was was not a political mouthpiece it was mostly news it got its uh 
major credit because 24 hours a day uh, served the world. I remember being in China once, depending upon CNN, to keep me aware of what's going on. But no real political statement. But this, I think, changed with Robert Murdoch. Uh, he he cut his teeth, if you will, with, uh, with, Ma- uh, with a newspaper in Great Britain. And uh, he made a point to blend opinion uh, political statements in with the news that carried over with uh, with Fox News, uh, but I think uh, Murdoch set the standard, break the deviation away from the traditional three television stations we had, plus CNN, which I think was more or less benign at that time, to what we have today. So I think that Robert Mur- Murdoch, for Rupert. good, Murdoch, R- Mur- Rupert. Rupert, Rupert, I'm sorry. I said, uh, so for good, bad, or indifferent, I think he is. Uh, he set the ground for what we're seeing today. Back to you, Joe. Yeah, bravo, John Gilstrap. I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, and, and that's kind of my point too. I think we can look at this in two ways. One is the man was very successful building a business. There's no doubt about that. A multi-billion-dollar conglomerate of, of uh, news and publications. Uh, but we can also be critical of how he did it. I, I, th- I always thought bringing in Roger Ailes was a watershed moment for Fox because that was that is when they had adopted the notion of, of being political operatives uh, it, it, to the point where they were counseling President Trump on speeches and public policy behind the scenes. All this was laid bare uh <laughs> because of of Rupert Murdoch's decision to litigate and engage in discovery, first in the Gretchen Carlson sexual harassment case, and then, of course, in Dominion. Uh, Those cases, uh, as a strategy for lawyers, should have been settled long before they engaged in discovery. But what what they did was they litigated, and we got all these emails, and we found out behind the scenes how those people at Fox really felt about Trump and about others. In fact, the irony of ironies, the Murdoch family supported Obama's presidency. Uh, they, 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 his run for the president, they were behind his campaign supporting it and then spent eight years savaging the man. So we, all this was discovered in the litigation. And so what, what you see here is, I think, a real dichotomy, uh, an effort to be a news organization, uh, to be, advertise yourself as such, but in, in actuality, operating like many other media outlets operate today, which is in a slanted way, one side or the other. And uh, I think it pays for us, the consumers of all this, to, to recognize them for what they are and to recognize the other stations for what they are, too. Joe, uh, correction, at least I think I'm right on this, is that the uh, the uh, uh, Murdoch uh family did not support biden one son did that was a middle son or the second son he supported biden the rest did not well I, i'm not sorry i might have misspoke uh, yeah. I, I meant uh, president obama they they oh, were oh, yeah. okay. supportive of his campaign in in 2008 and and then once he got elected of course we know they were just hammering on the guy for forever uh and and all this was discovered because you get emails and you get documents and internal memos and litigation. Uh, and I think Rupert Murdoch will go to his grave uh, disappointed that he made decisions to, to litigate rather than settle some of those cases early on, because that's what we discovered about uh, at least his organization. I'm sure we would discover that about others, too. But the bottom line is, again, as consumers, as the people who turn on the TV and watch the programming we have to recognize it for what it is joe in your defense i thought you said obama so no yeah yeah and, and oh, I, did I, I thought yeah. i heard biden okay yeah. Could be. i don't think that we can attribute uh the the lifetime of editorializing uh we can't just attribute that to what Fox News has done or say that they are the founders and the sole proprietors of editorializing. And I think Bill even said that, um, you know, they're not the only ones that do it. But there wouldn't be a market for Fox had not all of the news that was available before Roger Ailes was kind of slanted in one direction. There was a market that was untapped. There was people that, you know, weren't getting quality uh, news that they felt from the providers and that's why Fox became the number one uh, news network across America around that time now uh, 
I just hope that if we're talking about um, the news filtering certain talking points through Fox and working with administrations, I hope we carry that same, uh, you know, energy and that same talking uh, point with how social media companies have worked with, you know, the Democrat regime in censoring opposition, censoring stories that have came out, uh, whether it be with Hunter Biden's laptop or even intelligence agency talking points that have been found their way through uh, the journalistic groups and, and endeavors in this country. So uh, I think if we're going to talk about Rupert Murdoch's legacy, we have to be honest and we have to be fair and, and say that that's just the, the construct that we've had by having a media um, in this country. That's, you know, free journalism. That's how this operates. I fully expect the uh, Fox organization under Lachlan Fox to begin to reach out <clears throat> Um, maybe in a ham-handed way, but maybe more gently, to get the uh, One American News and and uh, other um, the other group, whatever one it is, uh, the to get them uh, back on board to get yeah. those customers. I think we're just being too optimistic. We the these organizations are businesses. They have to survive an environment where double did their surveys that show that double digit percentage of Americans get their news from Jimmy Fallon. You know, it's this this quest for actual truth is just is not it's important among those of a certain age who are used to getting our news from established sources. Those are going away. Those are those are dying. And now it's a it's a scream for attention and for eyes and for clicks and for views. And the, 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 a real journalistic piece, it can certainly be entertaining, but it, it, it's, it's not going to be a barn burner necessarily. Then you have the cases like Stephen Glass at National Review, who was making stuff up. He won awards for the stuff he was making up because people like to believe the stuff he was making up, but it was, it was all false, and it, and it completely collapsed the, the magazine. I, I think we're in real trouble as, as a nation, as a world, for that matter, in terms of getting the, the true view on anything. Now you throw in the deep fake technology and all of that. We're, it, we got a rough road ahead, folks. And I'll bring us back to something more pleasant, <laughs> which is the early days of the Fox TV network, which brought about the joke, assume Fox viewing television positions, which would be you standing on top of a couch with a hanger in your hand. Remember, it was all the old UHF channels is what they took over at first. And their initial TV lineup included Married with Children and the Tracy Allman Show. And this was the theme song to Married with Children as we go into the break. It's time for Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob Mario. I think the Admiral just uh, yesterday was fighting some more yellow jackets. Last right? night, I got my seventh uh, nest. Oh, you get like a, a badge for that or something. I, a patch I'm, on I'm your shirt. I'm notching my belt, yeah. and my belt is about to fall apart. So many notches in it. Don't let your belt fall <laughs> apart in this room. Bill was telling me he goes out at night. He he, he puts the 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 commando paint yep. on his face yeah. and, he's, and he's got the balaclava and he goes sneaking up on with the, my bayonet in my yeah, hand yeah exactly and to stab him to right. death. i don't know that <laughs> picture that, that picture showed bill with a sextant i don't think he's got the most <laughs> modern stuff but he knows where the nests are <laughs> <laughs> i'm not thinking the emerald is the most modern heat-seeking stuff there in the, in the room uh this uh hour of the program produced by the sports doctor colin mclaughlin and brought to you in part by the wagner law firm west virginia's premier dui defense attorney Go to, w, go to West Virginia DUI Lawyers .com today for more. Also, by Wayne Clark and the Locust Hill Golf Course, where they are currently making available to you the rest of 23 and all of next year, too, during their new membership drive with a discount of $500. Call the Locust Hill Golf Course Golf Shop today at 304-728-7300 or stop by at 278 St. Andrews Drive in Charlestown and uh, play around. Also, uh, here at the radio station, slash TV 10, we have tickets for the Hand Up to Recovery Benefit Dinner. And this will help the Adult Drug Court Program and Berkeley County Recovery Services. It's $60 a ticket for the dinner. The dinner is October the 14th. Doors open at 6, dinner at 7 at the Holiday in Martinsburg. You can come by this uh, very facility at 1762 Eagle School Road to pick up tickets between 10 and uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon with a check payable to the United Way of the Eastern Panhandle and put uh, Friends of Recovery in the memo section, or you can call 304 Six seven one ninety three twenty for tickets that way. Let's welcome back our Friday crew in this hour via telephone. Joe Joey Torts ready. Joseph, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to be back. Mr. Larry Schultz, attorney at law. 
Great to be here. Berkshire's Harmon and Jenkinson. Mr. John Gilstrap, New York Times bestselling author and his shirt, which has its own Facebook page. John. What a pleasure. Alonzo Perry. <laughs> Explainer of Alex Stein jokes. <laughs> <laughs> or defender thereof. <laughs> Definitely or, explainer. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield, who is on the clock. Yeah, I was surprised Joe came back after that photograph then showed for two day, two weeks in a row. You have show a lot of courage, my friend, he Joe. Does. Yeah. If yeah, I had a picture one. like yes. that anywhere in my portfolio, I would show it a lot. <laughs> Here's the part. As a matter of fact, Gilstrap has uh, he photoshopped his head on Ferretti's body from when Ferretti was 17. Yeah. What, I, what I was going to say is that doesn't really look like Joe Ferretti. So maybe it's the reason he's not saying anything is it's some model. <laughs> Could be somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Billy, you're on the clock. Yeah. I uh, intended to have um, uh, some of our local political issues coming up. I think some exciting, some interesting things happening. But after watching what's happening on the Hill in our House of Representatives, I think we need to discuss that. Uh, we, uh, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, the government shut down, and Rob's telling me my camera's all off. Take care of it, okay. Uh, the, uh, the government shut down, but it's showing a lot of cracks, uh, what we're seeing in the House of Representatives. Uh, McCarthy could not even get a procedural vote through yesterday, as, uh, as Senator Capito uh, uh, mentioned. And that is the most basic of basic things. Procedural votes go through all the time. Uh, and basically, that's, that's what it's saying. The Speaker wants to present something. First step, procedural vote. Everybody steps in line. They did not yesterday. Uh, they are uh, folks on the, uh, in the, in the, uh, Republican Party, the House of Representatives, uh, question his leadership. They question everything about him. But in the meantime, nothing is being done. What happens in our government if if the one of our major governing bodies ceases to be functional, becomes totally dysfunctional? That's what we're seeing right now in the House of Representatives. Uh, what are the long-term ramifications? Certainly the, the budget bill, the appropriation is one of them. But to me, that's only the tip of the, ver of the proverbial iceberg. All right, Joe, let's start with you via telephone. Well, I, I'm reminded of that line from one of the Batman movies when, when Alfred tells uh, uh, Mr. Wayne that uh, some men just like to watch the world burn. And, and I think that same phrase was used by one of our uh, members of Congress yesterday. Uh, they just want to tear it down, and they want to campaign on the idea that government's dysfunctional, win office, and go in and prove their theory. Uh, and that's what they're doing here. Uh, it, look, as the senator said in the first segment of the show, a deal was cut between the White House, McConnell, and McCarthy to get all this through, to keep the government running, to get things funded for, for certain funding cuts to be instituted, all that was on the table as a deal. And these folks who, who held out for 15 votes for the speakership back in January are now flexing their muscles and using the leverage they were given back then to scuttle the ship. And, and that's what's happening here, plain and simple. And, and uh, look, the Republicans know, they intuitively know that they are going to pay a price for this as they have with other shutdowns. They know this is a critical time for them with these elections coming up next year. And yet these folks who just seem bent on, on creating chaos are going to hang in there and, and be uh, being led by Matt Gates of, of all people. Uh, they're going to be uh, just going down this road to ruin. And, and it's a shame, but a lot of people are going to pay the price for it. And, and that, I don't know how we get out of it because – we don't have a speaker with any power. Uh, I suspect he will be deposed and, 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 and taken off that position. Uh, and I, Lord only knows where we're headed with this. Mr. Gilstrap. I think face value, the average American doesn't care if the government gets shut down. It's because it's always made better. You know, but it, no matter how long it lasts, people get paid back. And you know, so nobody's really out of money. Um, we see it as posturing. But having said that, the level of dysfunction of the 
greatest nation on earth, certainly greatest democracy on earth, it can't get out of its own way. And I think on the world stage, it's humiliating um, that that this is happening. But on the practical matter, down to if I'm if I'm a Republican in the House of Representatives, this is we got there's there's such a, a narrow window of opportunity in terms of the votes to to be. Uh, be able to get legislation passed, but at least it's a unique opportunity. And to squander that opportunity with these petty infighting, you know, just kind of swallow the differences and get get something done. But I think the Gates faction is so far to the right. It's it's the AOC, you know, counterbalance on 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 the left. But somehow Nancy Pelosi, not my favorite person, was able to keep her caucus in line. I don't know how she did it. Uh, It's none of my business. Clearly, Kevin McCarthy does not have that level of clout. And at the end of the day, we all suffer because I happen to believe the path that we are on has been set up by the previous Congress and the current administration. It's disastrous for the nation. But we're not going to we're not going to change anything. The elections are coming up and all people are going to re- remember about the Republicans of, of this Congress is they can't get out of their own way. Larry Schultz. They're not going to remember the promises they made in their 2020 platform to grow a more um, unified government because they never made such promises. They never passed a platform. We're left with a party that's about skirmishing in the moment and doesn't care about policy at all or outcomes at all. If you are willing to let one senator shut down the entire upper level of the military promotion system, and so that once in a great while you might sneak one guy through like they did the other day, but you, you can't. The government can't run its own military programs uh, the way they see fit to do. Then you're so divided within the Republican Party that you can't come together and even make a majority vote. Uh, this is really kind of unprecedented. I've, there have been lots of times that the Congress had a group of outliers, but this is usually the power of the speaker comes in, leans on those people, and all of a sudden they say, oh, well, I hadn't considered that. And pretty soon there's some kind of a deal. And, you know, it would be once in a while a dam in the one guy's uh, district and a new highway in the other guy's district. Um, That's ugly, but it's cooperation. We don't have that anymore. There's nothing Matt Gates wants that they can give him except his name in the paper, (laughs) his name on TV. And so the only way he's going to get that is by saying no to everything Kevin McCarthy says. Alonzo. Now, I mean, uh, when we've just spoke, though, uh, from the, the concessions that have been made, trillions of dollars have been spent in advance you know, um, of government funding and spending. So, I mean, it, it, the reason why I think Matt Gates is doing this, and we can say some semblance of it is sure, his name to get out there or whatever, but some of the concessions that he's asking for are perfectly reasonable. There are things that need to, to happen in order for us to start to balance the budget in some uh, regard here. Uh, but I think he's doing it in a manifest way that we'll lose. Uh, in in the eye of public opinion and um, the actual overall goal of what he wants to do, which is actually, you know, uh, take this oversized, bloated government and um, kind of streamline what we're doing. And uh, you can tell this just by the people that are leaving the faction on this particular issue. Look at Byron Donalds, who no one is going to say is a rhino, um, but has kind of came out and oh, said give, that give us a year, Alonzo, uh, until we yeah. push a little further right, and then he'll be a rhino. Maybe not even a year. No, I, it, But this is the thing, though. There's certain individuals that are saying, you know, uh, this is not the, the, the fight, and I think Republicans are having trouble picking, you know, which fights to win and lose, because we've always just been on the side of perpetually, uh, you know, allowing Democrats to get away with whatever they want. So uh, in some respects, I do think that this is a losing battle, but I don't say it's entirely unjustified. Goes back to you, Billy. Yeah, uh, we mentioned uh, Matt Gates. There's others that have uh, spoken up that's 
to me, equally frightening. Bob Good from Virginia says, let's close down the government. We don't need it. Uh, that's talking about one of our uh, uh, major leaders. Uh, but I see this as only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are other issues that we need to address. If we cannot address this funding appropriation for DOD, Department of Defense, which we've always been able to coalesce around. If we cannot fund, if we cannot get agreement on DOD, what chances do we have of looking at the Ukraine policy, looking at the immigration policy, uh, looking at the funding of the other appropriation bills? Uh, that, to me, is, is, is very frightening. Uh, and I think it all comes back to the to the speaker that there is a, a faction that do not agree with, and they're making the point. They're taking their uh, they're getting the blood out of the turnip uh, through the speaker. But look what's happened to our process. Our democratic process is on hold right now. For issue number three, traditionally in the Mike Height seat, Mike Height, but he's not here, so that goes to John Gilstrap. In 1979. Inexplicably, the Carter administration employed um, locals in Moscow to build the U.S. embassy. And surprise, 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 we found that they had riddled the place with listening devices and bugs and, and, uh, and to the point that after spending millions of dollars on this thing, we couldn't even move in. And it was sort of a forehead slapper at the time. Well, duh, you get your enemy to build the thing and... The turn, I'm turn, sorry. turn around, John. Turn around, John, before you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and John, you were saying? <laughs> Our producer, Cullen, has photoshopped John's head onto Joe's body. And that's <laughs> you know what? That, that, that's Colin becoming tortious. Ne Colin needs a raise. <laughs> Hey, Joy, you see? <laughs> now, you were saying, John, we were all distracted. Can we take that down? <laughs> I, want, I want my voice to get at least as far across. It's an interesting thing. You're trying to bring up a serious topic, and oh, you need to see the silent giggle. It's, like, it's either a booger. Si yeah. Silent giggle. There's nothing silent about a laughter. That next sound you hear is Colin dropping the mic and leaving the room. So. Yeah, all right, go ahead, John. We're sorry for that very unprofessional <laughs> bit of behavior by our producer, Colin McLaughlin, who should Shame never on you. do that Shame again. Shame on you. I had nothing to do with that, uh, wait, by the way. Wait till you see what happens to you in a book. Um, <laughs> the uh, I don't know where the hell was I. <laughs> Let's go to Alonzo Perry. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, were, we were shocked that we allowed our enemies to build something as important as an embassy on enemy territory. So but earlier this week, we lost an F-35 uh, strike fighter. It, it's a part of a $1.7 trillion program. It's a $100 million airplane, and we lost it because apparently the pilot ejected because of bad weather, and then we couldn't find it afterwards. And this kind of led to a discussion of, well, what might have happened? It turns out that 1,500 subcontractors are supplying the uh, the F-35 program, and most of the sensitive uh, electronics gear, the, the chips and what have you, are manufactured in Taiwan, which is replete with, with Chinese communist spies. So is it possible, I mean, it, it seems very reasonable to me that we are allowing our potential future enemy to have access to destroy our our weapon systems from within simply by you know a, a, a pre-existing computer code so my question to the panel is is it about time that we bring critical infrastructure that is directly tied to the department of defense and those programs back onto american shores and certainly keep them out of the hands of places that we know are not friendly to us it seems like a reasonable question to pose to the panel let's start uh, with the admiral bill stubblefield because you would know more than most on this yeah topic. john you're making a very good point in the last 30 years uh the u.s has gone from producing 37 percent of all the chips in the world to less than 12 percent so your point is very good uh is very well made however with that being said uh recently with the chip 
Chips and Science Act, which was signed in law in August, is $52 billion has been allocated or identified to strengthen our semiconductor chips industry. Uh, 39 of that is uh, for market initiative. Nearly $14 billion uh, is for research and development. We do have a problem. Uh, we have a major problem going from 37 to 12%. But I, there is money being it's been recognized as a problem. Defense has over $2 billion that they're pushing for Pacific uh, chip uh, for, for military purposes, <coughs> another, uh, another $14, 15000000000 billion for research. So we are addressing it, albeit kind of late. All right, to the phone with Joe Ferretti. Joseph. Well, uh, I think about Form Energy when I think about this topic because we wring our hands over the public-private partnerships that are arise and that are and deals that are struck to facilitate technology advances in this country. What we know for a fact is if we don't build it here, it will be built somewhere else. And you can be talking about solar panels. You can be talking about alternative forms for energy storage. You can be talking about uh, microprocessors and, and computer chips. If they're not built here, they will be built somewhere else. And what we need, and I think what we're developing here, is an effort to build the chips here. In the state of Ohio, the largest public-private partnership agreement for uh, an industry, has a deal has been struck, and Intel is building a $20 billion facility. That's 10 new cores being built in Ohio just outside of Columbus, to bake computer chips. I think we have become, we have begun to recognize that with the threats to Taiwan that China is, is currently making, uh, we had better do something, we better do it quickly. And I think we're on the right path to that. But we have to understand, as a public policy matter, it is going to take public-private partnerships to make this go. Uh, with the incentives that are necessary to get these companies to buy in and invest. That's just an immutable fact that we're going to have to deal with. So we can't be wringing our hands about pilot agreements and things of that nature to get these companies to do what we need to do in this country, uh, to keep a leg up on the rest of the world, because as John Gilstrap says, we are very vulnerable. And uh, we can't stand that vulnerability when it just takes money to get these deals done and an, un- an understanding of how they're going to get done in the future. Alonzo. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't compare this to Form Energy. One, because uh, the the I, I agree in some semblance that there needs to be a public and private relationship in the formation of some companies, but I don't believe that uh, Form Energy fits the, the that category simply because they've never created a product um, to actually put on the market. And what we're talking about right now is, you know, uh, the – capacity and ability to manufacture chips, which I mean is one of the most, if not the uh, linchpin in national security. Um, When we talk about energy production and being able to have fuel saving up strategic reserves, I'm all with you. But when we're talking about, uh, you know, a type of entrepreneurship that that speculative and and spending you know public funds on uh you know a, a dream that has never been you know co- like actually put on a commercial basis on the entire globe i mean that's a uh, a far reach so i i do agree with uh gilstrap that this is very concerning um that you know we haven't uh, reached a semiconductor independence, and we haven't brought that type of uh, facilities here. And uh, we also need to pay attention to what raw materials we're going to have to grab uh, to be able to produce them here as well, because a lot of the EV technology, I feel like, is you know extracting from uh, the, the 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 ability for us to make chips at a wide scale uh, capacity. Larry Schultz. Only 17 Republican senators voted for the Chips and Science Act. So um, a lot of Republican senators voted against that attempt by the uh, American uh, system to address this weakness, if that's what we're going to call it, um, of not having the capacity to produce chips for our own uh, aircraft and our own 
uh, other devices that are used in in war. Um, this is an example. You can take those seventeen people and put them against uh, the other twenty five or thirty, whatever the number would be, and you can see the split in the Demo- in the Republican Party that is going to harm somebody. I can't say who it's going to harm. Could harm the American people and then the Republican Party, or it could harm the Republican Party all alone. Uh, There could be others who are harmed. But when we do have a solution um, that is at least superior to whatever the free market is providing at the moment, I mean, all those years when the Chinese were developing their massive um advantage over us in the chips manufacturing american industry just sat there we didn't produce any privately funded chips uh um investment and so we fell behind now the government is going to try to make up for that failure of the free market to protect us and there are people in the republican party who say absolutely not absolutely not I don't know if the air, airplane crash had anything to do with, with Chinese chips, but um, we do need to address this problem, and we better hurry up. And you'd look no further than the collapse of the steel industry in the 70s for a marketplace that did not modernize itself over time on its own. Go ahead, Alonzo. Well, I, I'm not... I don't like, you know, not saying anything that I don't believe is grounded in fact. But, I mean, there's a pretty good, reasonable, you know, degree of suspicion you could have in um, was the chip hacked. I mean, how do you lose, a, a, you know, an 80, what, million dollar aircraft? A hundred million dollar aircraft? And, you know, there's, I, I get it. They obviously don't have, like, an AirPod, you know, or AirTag uh, that, like, Apple makes or something on it. But uh, in some degree, car how do you, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in some degree, you know, how can this happen? And and what is leadership doing? I remember when I was in the military, there was not a single sensitive item that we wouldn't shut down the entire base and walk, you know, for miles looking for, uh, like, a night vision goggle. You're telling me an entire plane just disappears and there's no wide-scale search effort. Oh, they and, found oh, it. Oh, they found it. Also, the, sheriff's the, department. the reason it disappeared was it's a stealth aircraft, and there is a, a tracer embedded in it so that U.S. can trace it. Uh, that tracer, that device failed or taken offline for whatever reason. Then it did what the aircraft is supposed to do. It became invisible to radars. Hmm. So it was a very reasonable reason why it disappeared. Uh and they were able to backtrack and using other sophisticated military technology, able to find it. Like it, looking it, for a it, giant it fire in the woods, right? Yeah. <laughs> it did, it did job. The, the actual disappearance of the airplane so is, kind of a, fire. is kind of a MacGuffin. You know, it, yeah. it's 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 what triggered the, the thought process that yeah. led to the debate. But it doesn't stop stop with defense. Um, the the upcoming uh, uh, dependence on electric vehicles, for example, you go to the lithium. The biggest lithium deposits are, Lord help us, in Afghanistan, or and, Ch- or Chile, or, or, or Chile. Okay, and so as we develop new technology, I'm astonished by the lack of imagination among American politicians. Uh, how do you, actions have consequences and inaction has consequences? And in the case of the steel industry, to just let it go away. It was was unconscionable, and of course, it doesn't go away. It just goes someplace else. Mm-hmm. But but John, if I can, you said you're uh, you're amazed at the lack of uh, a politician. But the Chips and Science Act did just what you said they should do. After the fact. It, well, no, it's for, well, yeah, but uh, you cannot d- undo what's been done over the last right. fifteen years. But the current Chips and Science Act, uh, over fifty two billion dollars addressing the problem that you're outlining and and i do appreciate the fact that you uh we got kind of caught up on the f-15 uh but it's uh it's much broader than that and you've you've alluded to that well we prioritize the calendar keeps turning man hey uh we move on with the friday five larry schultz is on the clock lawrence well ron DeSantis, who once led the polls in new hampshire and has now fallen to fifth still be politically alive at thanksgiving in the R presidential race. Ron DeSantis, future political viability by Thanksgiving. All right, why don't we start first with Alonzo? Well, let's hope he drops out of the race. Uh, 
before Thanksgiving or after Thanksgiving. I, Ron DeSantis is not an option. And, you know, what's funny is uh, we actually had a presidential uh, primary poll at the um, <clears throat> GOP dinner, and it was 80 percent for Donald Trump. We had uh, a tie, a four-way tie for Ron DeSantis, Vivek Ramaswamy, Nikki Haley, and uh, Tim Scott. And then uh, with a w- resounding one vote, we got uh, Mike Pence and zero um, votes for um, Christine. for Christie. Yeah. And so, you know, just with that result, it, it's clear who's the front runner and who's just running for some uh, position. And I don't think that uh, Ron DeSantis is going to find his way in the Trump administration. He was promoted for so long as the the shining uh, um, uh, second choice or the other choice. Uh, if you didn't want Donald Trump and boy, um, his ads and his uh, campaigning have done nothing but render him less and less relevant as the weeks have gone on. Joe Ferretti. As a retail politician, I think DeSantis is terrible. Uh, I don't understand what his message is. I've, I've watched a couple of his uh, presentations, and they're they're flat and they're you know, kind of churlish. Uh, I, I, I don't get him. Uh, I know he's very popular in Florida and uh, took a swing state and, and made it a solid Republican state. So uh, in that sense, he's been very successful. But on a national stage, he seems to shrink his performance in the first debate. You hardly knew he was there. And uh, and nobody focused on him, which was an indication that uh, the other candidates don't see him as a threat at all. Uh, so I thought that was a telltale sign. So I, I think uh, his campaign is, is just about over. I suspect the money's going to start drying up, as will the support. And uh, to me, uh, I think the most talented politician in the whole group that the Republicans have is Nikki Haley. Uh, I suspect that she will continue to rise a little bit in the polls uh, going forward. And and I I suspect that she will be the alternative to Trump for many Republican voters down the road. Billy? Yeah, picking up on what Joe said, I think that the Trump camp is hoping that DeSantis will still be alive in Thanksgiving because Nikki Haley is surgeon. Uh, she's uh, second in uh, in South Carolina. Uh, she's moving up uh, quite rapidly in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, once they start dropping out, the folks that do drop out, I think you're going to see a coalescence behind Nikki Haley. And if they do, the Trump camp is going to be nervous. Mr. Gilstrap. There's something about DeSantis that television doesn't like him. Some people just don't come through the camera well. Uh, I've never heard him speak in in uh, in person. He must do pretty well at it. I mean, he certainly did very well in Florida, and his policies in Florida have all worked. On paper, he looks like a really good candidate. I don't understand. There's an X factor that's missing, and I think it's an important X factor that's making him irrelevant to the, the campaign. So to answer the question, I... Thanksgiving is a little close at this point. I don't think he's going to make it into the into the primary season. Um, I like Nikki Haley. I don't know that she can gain enough traction to overcome the the behemoth of of Trump. Who, quite honestly, I wish would just have the decency to step away and take care of his personal problems and then run again later. But John, did you vote for Trump? Excuse me. Did you vote for Trump previously? I did. But, John, if you look at all the candidates, uh, Trump is polling generally less than 50 percent in most cases. Uh, so Among the, Republicans? Among the Republicans, okay. yeah. So if you look at if they coalesce, then that's the point I'm making. If they coalesce behind one or two candidates, then this huge margin we're seeing now will disappear. I hope so. Uh, uh, Alonzo, is it a foregone conclusion Trump wins the Republican nomination regardless of who drops out and who coalesces? Yes. Yes, there's a there's a ceiling for everyone, and um, I, I would say that there's uh, none of them will get over you know 25 percent of the vote in my opinion. Uh, if I had to put a, a, a percentage somewhere, you know, and I think that's even a stretch. Uh, but but you said none of them. And that implies we have a large field. If we call it, if we drop even, that field down even, to one or two, besides Trump, I think you're going to see a different story. I think that if you're going to vote for uh, Vivek, 
then you're probably not going to vote for Nikki Haley. I think if you're going to vote for Nikki Haley, you're not going to vote for a Vivek. You know, uh, it's so much of, uh, I think, the, the, the different sects of Republicans um, that are kind of going into this primary, they realize that, you know, Trump is our guy. And, uh, you know, I, I was watching, I rewatched um, him go against Hillary. And there was so much that, you know, was getting out in that period that, that Trump had made his appeal to the American people. And seeing now, uh, after his presidency and the four years after, it's going to be interesting to get him on the stage. And I think that's why, you know, Trump did relatively well uh, in his MSNBC interview. You know, Trump is going to be the front runner, um, despite, you know, I guess many in this panel's, you know, dismay. But uh, he's the guy. And I, I don't see anyone even getting close to beating Donald Trump. Comes back to you, Billy. No, oh, uh, I'm sorry, Larry. Larry, Larry. Um, it, I'll take it, though. Take it. <laughs> One thing time. that um, we just spoke about that's interesting is Tim Scott and Nikki Haley. They're dividing the votes of South Carolina right now, are they not? Not very much. Uh, um, Nikki Haley has uh, taken a substantial <clears throat> lead over uh, Tim Scott. Um, if one of them were to get out and endorse the other, and it sounds like maybe Tim Scott endorsing her, that might help. That might help uh, her chances and give her a little more viability. Um, I just don't know uh, whether there's enough here absent. And I will say that when Mr. Trump, every time Mr. Trump goes on TV and gives an interview, he makes admissions in these criminal cases that are going to be hard to run away from later. The things you say as a guy running for the presidency can always be uh, um, malleable and changed around as to their meaning. or their That doesn't work in criminal court very well. And when you say things like Donald Trump has said in recent interviews, you put yourself in a position as the defendant where you can't say anything else because you admitted this and that's going to be a very difficult thing so as he goes along and tries to campaign he's going to be handing ammo to the prosecutors because clearly but, he doesn't but is that i think that's part of the prosecutorial strategy here is the the justice department wants him to have to be quiet so that he he can't campaign. I think that the Democrat justice machine is trying to silence a an otherwise very strong candidate. But you're right. I mean, he is he's putting himself in peril, and I think he's he's going to bring more ire down on himself because he's not playing the game the way he's supposed to be playing the game, which is which is something he's never done. The backside of that is is terrifying. Um, you know, if if in fact. He, he is he's convicted in you know the month before the election I mean, it, would be, it, it would get ugly but uh, Tim Scott is another one that doesn't come across well on on television for whatever reason all right we go on to our uh, issue number five with Alonzo yes yeah, so uh, we, we can kind of get away from Trump a little bit and uh, I want to talk about something you know <laughs> Bill, go ahead and Bill's mic down he's at hell <laughs> well uh, I'm going to ask the panel here today, are advances in artificial intel intelligence significant enough to begin the conversation about how to address the technology and its effects on the workforce? And uh, it seems as if political leaders now are silent on the topic uh, during their campaign season. So is there any particular reason for that? Do you think it's not something appealing or uh, is it kind of one of those issues that they're just afraid to get into? John Gilstrap. I'm a First Amendment purist. Um, I think that everybody has the right to say what they want, however they want to say it, but within the guardrails of the law. Fraud is against the law, will always be against the law. There should always be against the law. So if somebody puts out a book in my name under chat GBT, there are avenues I can follow to find redress for that action. Um, it's a little terrifying when you get into the political realm, but there again, if we're going to have laws that, that address this issue, I don't think we address the technology itself. We, we have to address the use of the technology for nefarious means. And the problem with that is that politics happens fast and justice happens slow. So um, it, it's a terrifying thing, but as I've said for a long time ago, for a long time now, the technology it will spell the end of the world. It's kind of 
sad. You know, it is sad. Doom and gloom. I don't know. Continue it, from it there. Is, it is sad. Let I me mean, go it, back to that Photoshop picture that was happier. <laughs> I, I like John better when he was happier. I have a I have a bridge back to the Photoshop. <laughs> is it is it considered artificial intelligence? Uh, when people come to believe, as apparently some people now do, that the person um, <laughs> acting as John Fetterman in the United States Senate is a body double. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that there are people who actually believe that now, and that has to be for a six foot eight inch, three hundred pan uh, pound man covered with tattoos. One of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. I think it's. That it, anyone believes. I think people are hoping it is because reality <laughs> is that it's not, and that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> it is terrifying because he is an appealing guy. People like him. The thing, the little video the other day of him going ooh about the uh, about the um, impeachment inquiry. I, you know, I had friends from all over the political spectrum sending me that thing saying, that is pretty funny that he seems so scared. He's such a big guy. You know, you automatically assume nothing would scare the guy. But, yeah, he acts like he's frightened like a little child. And um, I, I don't know where it goes from here with John, but the idea that he's a body double is really off the charts crazy. Um, wow. yeah. Is that AI? No, no. I I was thinking that we were going to talk about like transportation, like you know, trucks, truckers being dis. No, no, no. We went to John Listen, Fetterman. Body, body double seems like a very you know an interesting way to go. Bill, which direction would you like to take, Alonzo's point? John depressed us. Larry amused us. Where do you want to go? Yeah. Uh, John made a point about a book. Uh, Larry made a point about a body image. Uh, both of those are laughable, and both of those are easily understood. But where I think AI poses a real threat is a more subtle treatment, the one that you cannot uh, stereotype or characterize. I think it does pose a threat. I think the reason, Alonzo, we're not hearing more about on the campaign trail is because the politicians and many others do not know how in the blazes to address it. They, uh, the best thing right now is just remain silent on it because we, it's, it's an issue we cannot really get our arms around. If we do get our arms around it, we don't get our collective arms around it. Certain people have one view, others another view. It is an emerging threat. As with, most, with a lot of emerging threats, we do not know how to address it. Joe Ferretti. Well, what industry goes before Congress and asks for regulation? I, I can't think of many who have done that in the past, except for these creators of AI. Uh, it was, what, two months ago that uh, Sam Altman and, and, and other entrepreneurs and inventors regarding AI went before a congressional committee and said, please regulate us. We see the future, and it's not good, and we need some guidance. We need some help on this because once we let uh, the horse out of the barn, it's going to be too late. And I don't know how – I don't know that Congress yet has the capacity to regulate. I don't know if they have the expertise in place to intelligently look at this industry and figure out where the dangers are and how to avoid the pitfalls down the road. We're not there yet. Uh, hopefully we will be there someday, and Congress will have the expertise at their fingertips, not themselves, but you know, with, with people on staff and, and people who are counseling them on how to deal with this. But this is a real problem. I, I think some of these unions up in Detroit and at these other automotive uh, factories that are on strike, they recognize this. They, they see job displacement in their future. And that's what part of the strikes are about regarding the UAW. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're going to see other unions similarly uh, have job actions in place and perhaps even striking because of concerns about the impact on their jobs and their particular industries. So in some respects, the forces will, will require us to look at this issue. But whether Congress... <laughs> is going to get up to speed in time to, to head off what is going to be a serious problem down the road. I, I'm, right now, I'm dubious about that. 
The AI issue is an interesting one on so many different levels, but the most fascinating part about what's going on with AI right now to me is this lawsuit that 17 mostly well-known writers have going on right now in regards to artificial intelligence, which operates in such a manner that it steals everything that you've accomplished in your life to feed itself uh, knowledge with no compensation going to you. So in effect, AI is asking us all to train our replacement for free of charge while we go unemployed the rest of our lives, uh, other than whatever scraps are thrown our way. This lawsuit, to me, is going to be a fascinating one in terms of how it comes down, uh, John, because of what the basic concept of AI is. Well, piracy has been, a, has been an issue in the book world for years. Um, thank you, China. Um, so this, this is another element of it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's scary i guess i i don't think anything that involves the arts whether it's writing or painting or anything else i i believe that there's an x factor that comes from from the human mind i don't think it'd be replicated by um ai but you know a close facsimile can be more frightening than that is i think his name is jim dale he's the narrator of the harry potter books and God knows how many words there are in the Harry Potter books, but um, he's very good at what he does. And now he just came forward and said that the his voice is being used by AI to narrate um, documentaries and such that he has nothing to do with. Now, in that case, that's 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 pretty serious stuff. But that's again, I think I think laws exist to prevent that from happening, but it just takes time. You know, it's going to it's going to be out there. The money's already be spent. It's not going to go back to Jim Dale, at least not from customers. It's 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 a it's a scary time. There, but you're right. There are laws in place that prevent theft of property. There is no law currently in place that governs the way AI gains its intelligence and expertise. Mm -hmm. and no, but, but you and, and cannot, the way it gains it is by searching everything that we've all done to learn from us. Yes, and everything you put on social media goes into an AI. Uh, program as well to to make sure that you are as convincing as your non-self as, as your non-self is as convincing as it can possibly be it's a terrifying time a few years from now we will all be sitting here with colin having photoshopped our heads on different bodies <laughs> with our voices from the past I, doing I, this show i hope my head goes on joe ferretti's body <laughs> I was envious when uh, Joe Scrapp's uh, image came up a while ago. Joe, the question has been posed by none other than Mike Hornby himself as to whether that's really your body. Yeah. It is. <laughs> 30, 30, 30, and, 35 and, years ago. <laughs> hey, uh, we've got about a minute to go. There was uh, a question posed by Bill in regards to uh, Craig Blair and Patricia Rucker and what we're seeing as potentially de facto elections being held by candidates uh, that are in part influenced by Rucker and Blair. Alonzo, just to get your take on this uh, very clearly in the final 30 seconds we have here, is that something you think is actually going on? I think that there is some semblance of uh, a kind of competing interest uh, between uh, Senator Rucker and Senator Blair, but uh, we'll just have to see how it turns out. And you know, um, uh, how would a non-politician answer <laughs> this question? <laughs> a blood feud. Yeah. Final thoughts are next. Thoughts. We start first on the phone with Joe Joey Torts for Ready Go. Mike Hornby, expect a cease and desist letter from my office. <laughs> Larry Schultz. It's amazing when a picture of you can hurt you. Right? Um, congrats to the WVU Mountaineers on a great win over Pitt. Bill Stumblefield. And Joe, we're all envious, regardless of what we say. Alonzo Perry. Uh, go Notre Dame this Saturday against Ohio State. John Gilstrap. Evidence to the contrary, notwithstanding, I truly am one of the world's great optimists. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to kill us all, I'm telling you right now. Hey, Dave Ramsey Show is coming up next. This is Talk Radio, WNR Martinsburg and TV 10. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you again in 70 short hours. It's 5 o'clock somewhere.